Hello everyone. Welcome to my tutorial on wine analytics. I've done quite a bit of work in analytics applied in the wine industry. And today I am excited to be sharing my vision of descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics that can be very easily used not only in the wine industry, but also other agricultural environments. So let me make a statement that I'm not a social drinker. Uh, most of my wine drinking is associated with work. Uh, I'm going to talk about fine wine, which is expensive wine, uh, such as those. I don't buy them. I don't uh, consume them. Uh, that's not what I do. But they are the most heavily traded wines uh, in marketplaces. And uh, they attract the investment alternatives and, and uh, other companies in this uh, particular industry. And it's quite useful to understand how um, analytics is applied for this particular um, segment. Uh, literature on wine is pretty extensive. Uh, it starts with wine economics. And in that, the canonical work is um, conducted by Ashan Felter, uh, 2008. In this study, uh, Ashan Falter uh, develops an analytical method, an empirical method, that examines uh, the growing conditions of um, grapes for a vintage of wine and estimates after 20 years of aging or so, uh, very accurately, how that climatic conditions uh, can be used in order to understand the value from that wine. And there are many scholars who examined similar problems, but mostly explaining how climatic conditions and uh, tasting expert reviews can be used to understand the value from the wine. None of them, except the first study, Ashan Felter 2008, uh, in that little box, is uh, attempting to make a predictive analytics work. It's mostly explaining uh, with traditional econometric an analysis. Finance colleagues also used uh, wine industry to uh, develop many analytical uh, studies, particularly Dimson, for example, 2015 study shows that young Bordeaux wines yield a higher return than aged Bordeaux wines. Similarly, Hekimolu et al. 2017 study shows that given a limited budget, and given the risk aversion uh, perspective of a distributor, importer, a buyer, how can they split their budget into buying wine futures and bottled wine? In marketing, the big question would be, how do we understand consumer preferences? And particularly, that is used in order to estimate the willingness to pay functions, as well as, uh, um, investigating tasting room uh, experiences so that a winemaker can use direct to consumer channel versus a traditional distributor wholesaler and liquor store um, uh, type of supply chain uh, infrastructure. We're also conducting research in the interface of operations and marketing. Our studies particularly emphasized advanced selling mechanisms and how they can be used in order to uh, mitigate the risks, especially in the life of uh, winemakers. No et al. 2015 and 16 papers, for example, look at the um, critic scores and the uncertainty associated with the critic uh, evaluations. Using that, it's prescribing a model using a multinomial logic model, how a winemaker can determine um, the amount of wine to be sold in the uh, futures uh, level, as well as the price of those uh, futures contracts. So I'm going to talk about some of those, and particularly with the No Parumpa paper. So what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to give a little bit of background on this prescriptive analytics work that has been used uh, in the industry. So in a wine supply chain, we have the supplier, which is the winemaker, a buyer, uh, often it's the distributor or uh, importer. Uh, Southern Glazers is the largest wine distributor in the world, uh, but we have also other importers such as Vinfolio, KNL, and other ones. And right in the middle, we have a financial exchange called London International Vintners Exchange. This is where 
all of these fine wines are traded um, and it creates an environment where the buyer and seller come together um, in a marketplace. I'm gonna start my description with winemaker. Uh, so we're gonna go to that and we're gonna see a prescriptive model and some predictive work uh, in that as well. So um, in this slide, what you are seeing is a Lafitte Rothschild of 2008 vintage. What does 2008 vintage mean? The grapes are harvested in September, October of 2008, and it's crushed at that time after a short period of fermentation. The wine is sitting in the barrel for two years. This wine does not get bottled until 2010. But French figured out how to sell this wine before the wine is even bottled. What you're looking at here is a picture of trading um, um, prices starting from mid-April 2009 in Livex. So early in uh, April, in mid-April, uh, the price of a one case of Lafitte Rothschild 2008 in 2009, these are being traded, one case, 12 bottles, is selling for 1,500 to 2,000 uh, British pounds. As you see, as soon as Robert Parker, the most influential critic, rates this wine in the barrel sample that this is 98 to 100, implying that this wine has the potential to become a perfect wine, 100 out of 100, then the trade prices increase by 50 to 75%. And if you look at the right-hand side of this uh, picture, you will see that towards the end in September, early September, the prices are climbing up because of these reviews. This wine is not gonna be bought until 2010, so it has another nine months at least um, of aging process, and yet it's being uh, priced uh, and its price is increasing because of the reviews. So what I'm gonna show is that a multinomial logic model, a prescriptive model of how we can use this information in order to help a winemaker uh, determine what proportion of its wine to be sold in the form of wine futures before it's even bottled and at what price. In time zero, grapes are harvested and the aging process begins. Approximately six to eight months later, wine critics such as Robert Parker, as you see in this picture, comes to the chateau and takes a sample of uh, wine from the barrels. This is referred to as barrel tasting. And he gives a score, often out of 100, some British critics are giving scores out of 20. Um, and that score is known as the barrel score. I refer to it as S1. And based on S1, the winemaker has to make a decision as to how much of his total production to be sold as wine futures, QF, and at what price, PF. Knowing that, there will be a different score later on. So a year later, when the wine is bottled, the same critic reviews the wine again, and this is referred to as bottle tasting and bottle score. I refer to it at, as S2, and it's random at the time, T1, when the barrel tasting occurs. S2 is going to influence the selling price in the retail form, which we refer to as PR. What's important to us is time point T1. After we observe the barrel score of S1, the random score of S2 is going to come out, but we're gonna be making this decision of QF and PF, quantity of futures and price of futures at time T1, knowing that S2 is random. Now, we can also make some judgments, such as um, the random score that we don't know, S2, is going to be similar to S1, but it can deviate from that. Um, the reason for that is a wine critic who gave the score of S1 would not want to look terribly different than the original estimation, and that's the reason that we see the expectation of S2 to be um, uh, close to S1, and if you apply a means test or anything like that, you will see that that would be holding true. So I'm going to examine this particular component of uh, a winemaker. 
So first thing is that the market size for wine futures is going to be influenced by the realized battle score S1. And I'm going to increase the market size with S1. So its derivative is positive. That's reflecting the hype effect that we have um, uh, based on the battle score that we saw in the picture. We're going to examine consumers from um, three choices, um, from the perspective of three choices, buying the wine as futures, and there's a utility corresponding to that, UF. Buying the wine a year later in retail, utility UR, representing that retail purchase a year later. And the third choice of not buying the wine, U not. And we can calculate the quantity of futures that we want to release to the market that should equal the demand for these futures. And how do we calculate that? We take the market size, M, that's influenced by the score, barrel score of S1, multiplied with the probability that the utility from futures is greater than the utilities of retail purchase and no purchase. So the question is, how do we estimate that probability? So for that, we use the description of the multinomial logit model. And in that, uh, we use a Gumbel error term. And this theta S1 is representing the risk adjusted discount rate of the consumers for buying today and consuming this good a year later. Um, and this is basically estimated because of the fact that we're paying today, uh, sorry, um, we are paying for the retail uh, tomorrow, but also we're enjoying it uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, so it comes to the Gumbel error term uh, epsilon r. And we can now estimate the demand for futures by using the traditional uh, multinomial logic model for a given price uh, PF. We also estimate the winemaker's preference of taking cash today as opposed to tomorrow. And that's referred to as phi in the model. And the winemaker has two components in his objective function. The first is representing the revenue, price of futures, multiplied by the quantity of futures released to the market at that price. And then the second uh, stream of revenue comes from retail sales. Capital Q is the total production. QF is what we sold as futures. So the remaining component is the retail sales. It's happening at the expectation of the retail price PR for a score of S2 that we anticipate at time T1. And phi is the discount rate of the winemaker. Um, how do we estimate that um, discount rate phi? We use a capital asset pricing method for that. We first take the risk-free rate and we add a proportion of the risk premium with looking at the uh, returns in the wine market minus the risk free rate. This gamma is estimated for each winery separately. And what we do is that we take the covariance of the returns of the chateau with respect to the market returns that we see in the LiveX exchange, financial exchange, dividing it by the variance in the market returns in this particular industry. That gives us the estimation for the phi, and we can now use that in order to solve this model. We solve it, we obtain closed form expressions, uh, and using that, we can now estimate how Bordeaux chateaus actually established their very first release to the market as known as uh, first trench. Um, so using the data that we have in our sample from Angulus to Troplon Mondeau, we identify that Bordeaux Chateau's release in their first trench, approximately 28% uh, of the wines into the market, and that improves their profits by 10%. This kind of mechanism is extremely beneficial for small artisanal boutique wineries. An example of that is Hard and Hands Wine Company. The person that you see in the middle of this picture is Susan Higgins, the um, founder of this uh, wine company with her husband, Tom Higgins. And they have the intention of making the best Pinot Noir in the United States. Pretty bold statement, pretty bold goal. 
uh, for this company. But they have been extremely successful. They have been uh, winning a lot of competitions, blind tasting competitions, and featured in uh, Wine Spectator as the best winemaker in uh, Finger Lakes several years ago, uh, including uh, TV shows such as ABC's Morning Show um, describing the success story. Um, the thing is that for these winemakers, it's absolutely essential to mitigate the risk and they don't have the financial means that a large Bordeaux Chateau would have. So we took their data, we examined how um, they would be operating in this uh, environment if they were to get uh, their ones to restaurateurs, distributors, um, who want to lock up that small production quantity. And what we find is that when the winemaker is not very well known, uh, they would have a very homogenous um, consumer base, those who visited the tasting room. Um, in that situation, the small winemaker would sell more than half of its stock into the market, and that would increase the profit by around 14%. When they are known more uh, and they establish a more heterogeneous consumer base, they would reduce their release to the marketplace uh, in the form of futures um, up to 32% or so, and that would uh, get them 15% profit improvements uh, in their portfolio. This is very useful for um, small and artisanal winemakers in the United States and wine spectator Rene Story stating that should we establish a wine futures market in the United States? Um, they refer to this as entrepreneur in uh, Bordeaux. So that's the term that they used. And the person you see in the picture is Tom Higgins, the husband uh, who's attending the Pinot Noir grapes. So does this mean that the winemaker is earning money and improving profits by using wine futures? Does that mean a distributor is losing money by buying these features? Here's Southern Glazers, uh, according to Forbes, 17th largest uh, company, privately owned company in the United States. Uh, and uh, they are the largest wine distributor in the world, as well as um, the United States. And they have operations in 44 states here. We have the very same problem and we will examine a distributor's problem this time. Uh, it can be an importer, it can be a restaurateur, whoever is engaged in buying of these uh, futures contracts. So this time we're gonna introduce another prescriptive model, but that's gonna be based on the predictive analytics work and it's going to change how we define uh, some of the uh, parameters that we use. Let's go back to our 2013 vintage wine where the grapes are harvested in September, 2013. Wine futures contracts are offered in May, 2014. And the swine is bottled in um, the summer of 2015. So I'm gonna focus on that May, 2015 decision, uh, particularly uh, from the perspective of the uh, distributor. Now in May, 2015, the bottled wine of 2013 vintage is not the only asset available in the market. In fact, in September 2014, we harvested the 14 vintage grapes, crushed them, and started the aging process. So in May 2015, we had the bottled wine of 13 vintage, as well as the futures contracts for the 14 vintage. If I have only $100, how do I split that $100 between bottled wine and futures contracts? This is a problem of a distributor and we're gonna examine that. But before doing that, we have to understand how uh, wine prices, both as futures and bottled wine, evolve over time. So what you see here is a little bit of empirical investigation in order to understand this uh, functional uh, evolution over time. So F1 represents the futures price being uh, released for vintage T minus one in year T. And it evolves to F2 and F3 in the model that we're gonna use. F2 is at the end of the summer and uh, F3 is uh, one year later, which is the next purchasing cycle uh, that we have, which actually F3 means the bottle price. 
So in that, I'm going to examine the impact of weather and market fluctuations in the upcoming year and how that influences the futures prices. Particularly, I'm going to describe this in a relationship like this, uh, moving from May of calendar year three to September of the same calendar year and May of the next calendar year. So let's look at the empirical analysis, what it shows us. So when we look at the weather conditions uh, of the upcoming vintage, which is basically corresponding to vintage T, that weather condition influences in a negative way the price of the previous vintages futures contract. So from May to September, we now have a new signal. And if that signal is such that the weather of the upcoming vintage is better than the previous year's uh, vintage, then that should lead to a reduction in the futures price. So F2 would be smaller than F1 uh, from the initial price. And that's statistically significant at the highest level of 1%. And if the market is moving up, then we see a positive impact as well. We continue to examine this when prices evolve from September to next year's May, and we see the very same pattern, uh, weather continues to influence in a negative manner at the highest statistical way and market in a positive way. So we use both of that information and define F2 and F3 as a function of weather and market fluctuations. This is the information that we capture. We also look at the evolution of prices in bottom line and we define B1, B2, B3 for the very same time points uh, in the next year and examine the impact of weather and market. Weather, in this case, does not influence uh, the evolution of bottled wine prices, unlike futures. And market has a positive impact and also very high significance, and we continue to see that um, uh, in the bottled wine prices. So for that, we're gonna be defining the bottle price as a function of the market fluctuations and exclude weather. What does this tell us? Futures is a riskier asset because it is impacted by two different random factors, weather and market, whereas bottled wine is less risky asset compared to futures because it's only impacted by market fluctuations. So we're gonna incorporate all that into our uh, modeling approach, F1, F2, and F3. And here we're gonna incorporate the weather and market uncertainty with uh, W tilde and M tilde. And we're gonna also capture all other uncertainties with two additional random variables. But our functional form is derived from the predictive analytics that we saw earlier before we actually develop the prescriptive analytics model. One critical component of this is the initial release price F1, which you will see in a little bit how important it is because if F1 is very high, uh, then it might be an overpriced wine uh, futures contract and it might be also an underpriced one. So we're gonna be honing into that F1 uh, valuation. But for the, for the minute, let's uh, look at the distributor's problem of futures versus bottles uh, in May 15, the distributor can buy futures contracts of the 14 vintage or the bottles of the 13 vintage. And when September comes, we get the information about the new vintages, um, uh, climatic conditions, as well as how the market is moving. And in September of 2015, the distributor can buy more futures or sell some of uh, an, an all of its futures that are purchased in May or by additional bottles, um, we cannot really sell because it's moving to the downstream. So that's already being generating revenue in that case. But if there is any cash, we can also buy additional um, uh, um, bottled wine. So for that, we develop a two-stage stochastic program. And stage one model is described at the bottom of the slide. And in that, X1 represents the dollar amount invested in wine futures and Y1 represents the dollar value invested in the bottled wine. And we do that in the presence of weather, market, and all uncertainties. And we have a budget B, 
So our investment in futures and bottle wine uh, cannot exceed that budget that we have. And we continue to insert that constraint in stage two model, where in stage two, we decide how much of the futures that we sell or buy X2 and X2 in this case can be both negative and positive, as well as uh, how much additional bottles that we buy, which is Y2, which is uh, not negative. So we cannot sell more than what we purchased in stage one, in stage two, and that's enforced by this constraint. And the interesting part of this modeling approach is that we incorporate a value at risk measure, but we do it in a time consistent manner, meaning that uh, the probability that the profits of this distributor uh, being less than beta dollars cannot be uh, more than alpha probability. So this is the value at risk and we continue to monitor it in stage one and stage two for all of the evolution possibilities of uh, weather market and other uncertainties. We saw this, we obtained the optimal results. Uh, we see that uh, the winemaker needs, uh, sorry, wine distributor has to invest in futures and that's improving profits. In fact, uh, we estimated by using that solution and predicting how much benefits uh, are added with a constant budget. And in real life, we don't have to have the same budget for each of these chateaus for the distributors uh, problem. But you know, this is a conservative estimate in that sense. And it's giving us somewhere between 21 to 25% uh, improvement. Uh, this is pretty substantial for the distributor. Distributor is benefiting from the fact that futures are more liquid. It can uh, enable uh, the distributor to change the position in September, even if they buy it in May. So I'm gonna now go into F1 prediction, predictive analytics. And uh, the same picture, winemaker, distributor, and the market uh, we have. And I'm gonna get much more focused on the market prices, uh, starting from the upstream where they are first released to the market, and then how the consumers are impacted by that as well. So let's understand the Bordeaux wine supply chain. It's different than the US. Uh, a chateau like this one, Margot, uh, selling to a middleman called Negociant. This is a requirement in Bordeaux. All Bordeaux wines are sold to a middleman known as Negociant. The first one that you see, Behrman, established in 1620, uh, known as the oldest Negociant in the world. Uh, but there are a lot of them from that period uh, today still operating. In the US, we have Joanne, Diva, Duclat, uh, and uh, various other uh, negociants that bring the French wine into the US market. So the Chateau sells to a middleman negociant and the wine is released to the secondary market at what is known as the ex negociant price. And it's constant. From all negociants, this is the price that's released to the market. Then distributors like Southern Glazers, merchants like k &L, importers like Vinfolio, um, or merchants like the oldest one in London, Berry Bros and Rudd, uh, would be purchasing this wine from negociants and selling it to consumers. And they establish the consumer prices. This is referred to as X London prices uh, in LiveX uh, platform. Uh, but we're gonna look at both uh, X negociant and X London uh, in a bit. We're gonna start with X negociant. So let's look at the distributors problem. Uh, and take, uh, sorry, not the sugars. Uh, we, we look at the wine production. Uh, September 2015, we harvest the grapes. And there is a tasting in April 2016 that reveals the barrel scores and futures prices are established in May 2016. This wine is going to get bottled in the summer of 2017. And we are focusing on the price in May 2016 as the futures price, which is the ex negociant price. This is important to uh, platform executives such as Sarah Phillips and, um, and also all the distributors, buyers that you can imagine. Uh, how accurate, how good is this price? Is this an overpriced one or is this an underpriced one so that I can have the confidence in making the investment? We're going to use the ex negociant prices in order to run our analysis. 
And this is actually very hard to predict. In fact, LiveX ran a survey of the 440 largest wine merchants in the world. And they asked them, here's a basket of wines from Costa Estanel to Ponte Canet to Montrose, all the way to Mission Port Lyon. What do you expect for the 2015 vintage wine futures contracts released? It's gonna be released in May, 2016. What do you expect the price to be? They estimated the numbers that you see here as 98.60 euros and so on. And the value of the basket came to 1,600 euros. But in reality, when these wines were released as futures contracts to the market, the basket had a value of 2,045 uh, uh, euros. Actual prices being 27% higher than the expert's prediction. It's not easy, as you see. This is still quite erroneous, even for people who have the intimate knowledge of these uh, wines, as well as the futures market. We knew that summer of 2015 was warmer than the summer of 2014. And in the wine business, warmer summers mean better wine, concentrated grapes. Uh, and as a result, the price should be high. So these merchants, the experts, 440 experts, we're looking at the 2014 vintage um, futures contracts, and they were adjusting those prices for 2015. Their expectation is that the prices would jump by 18%, but the actual turned out to be 46%. It's such a huge gap. Why is that the case? We're interested uh, in that part. Lots of economics literature examined how prices can be explained by temperature, rainfall, and tasting experts, and I put all of those. But a lot of them fail to make predictive work. And Hekimolu et al. 2020 uh, is quite comprehensive in terms of the data, in terms of the analytical uh, modeling approach, and uh, improves a lot of the results that you have here. So what does wine economics literature say, especially with Ashan Felter, the canonical work in the field? What do we know? We can use climatic information in order to predict the value in mature wines, wines that are aged for 20, 30 years. And in, in their own publication, they admit that they cannot predict the value from young wines, wines that are trading as futures contracts, young wines such as recently bottled wines. And they are pretty erroneous, as you will see in a few slides. What do we need? We need objective benchmarks in order to establish confidence in the investor's mind for these ex negociant prices, the very first release price to the secondary markets. So here's the Ashan Felter 2008 results from the publication. These are direct copy from that. 36% um, error for young wines. That's pretty substantial. If you're the buying person for any distributor, importer, um, this is how you would feel. You are trying to do something without knowing um, exactly how these are going to evolve. So what does our wine research trail look like? We're going to, we're in the upstate New York. We're going to go to Bordeaux. Bordeaux is divided into left bank and right bank with a river. We're going to take a flight. <laughs> Listen to Edith Piaf and that romantic French music. But in the meantime, we're gonna collect a lot of data regarding temperatures, precipitation, market fluctuations, and tasting expert scores. We're gonna use that information in order to build empirical analysis and predictive analytics work to understand and value these uh, futures contract prices known as the ex negociant prices. We're gonna rigorously test our models before I fly back to the United States and report our, um, our results. We're gonna share it with the market. We're gonna assist buyers. Hopefully the results will be fantastic so that we pop a champagne to celebrate that. This is our team, me on the far left with my colleagues, Theodora, Andreas, my co-author Hakan, 
then Sarah, Ed, uh, Yanis, and Neil. Uh, Neil is the vice president uh, at Livex uh, in charge of the data and these kinds of analyses. Here's my account. I don't trade. I don't influence anything except that we actually offer to the market our valuations. Here is the set of uh, uh, data that we use. And in that, um, you, you can see the top uh, chateaus uh, with the, uh, starting from Angulus to the Chateau uh, Satan. Uh, I want to show how the market works. So I am here in the um, uh, LiveX platform. You're looking at that. It basically shows uh, the bid, the offer, last trade, as well as the market uh, prices. We can actually do a quick search. We mentioned Lafitte Rothschild, so let's go there and uh, see um, what the prices look like. Let's take 2005, uh, 2005 vintage uh, of this uh, chateau. You can actually, the best list prices, average list prices, the scores, and the trades. And these are all how many people bought, and uh, you get all that information as well as the inventory of this uh, from different times. You know, you can see the stock available, um, what it is selling for, the average prices, uh, and so on. Uh, and you don't have to do it for older vintages. You can do it for wine futures contracts. And let's go to 2019. And remember, 2019 is not even going to be bottled until 2021. So all of the trades that you see here are trades of uh, wine futures uh, contracts. And it's a very, um, um, uh, it's a very expensive wine so, uh, we picked, uh, but we see also who has it, uh, how many is available out there and at what prices uh, and so on. So let me head back to my presentation so that you know how the market looks like. Uh, we, we have the entire data starting from 2001 to today. You may not remember anything from this presentation. I'd like you to remember this descriptive analytics picture. If you look at panel data, you won't be seeing any kind of behavior. This descriptive perspective is looking at the change in prices from the prior vintage. So it's looking at the percent change from the year before, and you can see that in 2003, 2005, 2009, prices went up uh, pretty drastically. In fact, in five and nine, you will see almost 400% price increases uh, for these uh, futures contracts. And what's critical in this picture is that most chateaus follow the very same behavior. There are some that's different and that's gonna happen because of the fact that their critic scores are uh, different from each other. Um, but we're gonna use this information in order to make better uh, and develop a better uh, predictive analytics method that is relying on the change perspective rather than level panel data. Um, so let me introduce the model then. Uh, we're gonna look at temperatures, average growing uh, temperatures uh, during the growing season. Um, uh, rainfall during the growing season. We follow an index called LiveX 100 index that is tracking the prices for the 100 most sought after wines in the world. These are typically uh, wines from prior vintages, but they can be used for uh, making predictions uh, into the future. We're going to also track the changes in barrel tasting scores. Uh, of the influential critics, and those are the four primary components of our predictive analytics, although we have uh, substantially more data. So let's understand each of these factors, weather first. Um, for the 15 vintage that we mentioned, wine futures contracts will come out in May 2016. We already know the growing conditions from May 15 to September 15. And we know in May 2015, 14 vintage wine futures were also released, and we know the price of those. We also know what the weather was like during the summer of 2014. If 15 was a better weather, then we would expect the wine futures prices from 14 vintage to increase when it travels to 15 uh, vintage futures prices. Rain 
is uh, also an important component. Um, uh, in the wine industry, less rain is more desirable so that we can have very concentrated grapes with minerals. And when we press them, we can make bold, beautiful um, uh, wines. So less rain, higher temperatures are uh, better wine uh, producing uh, climatic conditions in general. Uh, and here's the temperature and rainfall between the left bank and right bank aggregated. The orange and red uh, colored um, dots are showing us the temperatures on average in the left bank and right bank, even though we are using um, uh, data that is collected by many um, uh, by many uh, weather stations of Meteo France, uh, the weather channel of, um, of France. Um, but uh, this is basically aggregating all of that data. And um, the blue and green bars are showing the rain levels on the left bank and right bank respectively. And as you can see, no vintage looks like the other one. So they are all very different and that's going to be incorporated into the model. We also track the market conditions from May to March. And uh, we know that if the index value is increasing, then the price should also be increasing. And this is the index since its inception in 2001. If the critics actually give a higher score, 92 to 96, that means the price for 15 should be higher than 14. So that's also something that we see. So how does our model work? We're gonna take the change in prices from the prior vintage, and we're gonna take the natural log of the change in futures prices, and we're gonna regress it using logarithmic change in average temperatures, and we're gonna be looking at the growing conditions and the prior vintages growing conditions in that. Similarly, we're gonna use logarithmic change in total rainfall, logarithmic change in the LIVEX 100 index, and finally, the difference in barrel tasting scores. And here's the description um, in plain English, but also expressing it in mathematical terms. Using that, we're gonna um, run an excessive number of uh, regressions to be able to see whether all of these um, variables are good in terms of explaining and predicting uh, wine prices. Uh, so models one through four examine each variable by itself. They are all statistically significant at the highest level of 1%. Model seven combines all of those four variables. Everyone is statistically significant at 1%. The model that we will choose is model nine that incorporates all four in addition to that, there is an interaction term. Whenever temperatures are up and the index is up, we get an additional boosting factor with this coefficient here. We're choosing model nine, even though model nine does not have the highest R square. In fact, the R square that you see in model nine is 74.62%, which is quite impressive. But there is another model, model 15, that has an R square of 74.68%. But this model has one additional variable that's statistically insignificant. And the metric that we need to use for predictive performance is not R square. R square is great for understanding explaining factors, but for prediction, we're going to use a Kaike information criterion. And with that, we select the model that has the least AIC score, which corresponds to model nine. Using our model nine, we plot next estimated prices against the actual prices. And as you see, if you take these dots and uh, fit a line to see how well we are performing between our estimations and, and actual prices, Ideally, you want all these dots to be sitting on a line, on a 45 degree line, which indicates y equals x, and r square of 100%. That's impossible, we know that. But the estimated line here is almost perfect. y equals 1.0002x, and our r square is close to 95%. One might intuit that 
this fit is good because of the fact that we're ignoring an intercept term. Even if we add intercept, which is not statistically significant, our R square is uh, 91%. Um, one might also intuit that you have cheaper wines as well as expensive wines, and your performance may not be equally good at different price levels. So what we do is we offer a quantile regression for lower price wines below 25th percentile, wines that are in the middle between 25th and 50th and 50th and 75th percentile, and the expensive wines about 75th percentile. Our performance is equally good in all of these, and our R square is uh, 95 to 97 percent uh, in all of those. So our conclusion is that we get consistent performance at different price levels. I want to also highlight the fact that we don't have collinearity. You see the correlation table here, but also all of the variable inflation factors uh, are the highest one is 2.43 corresponding to the interaction term, um, which is still less than the uh, commonly used threshold of five uh, in econometric uh, models. So no collinearity that's impacting our uh, results. So in that series first reaction, we actually provided our estimations before the market opened in 2007 for the 2017 vintage in 2018 as a summary report. And you can see that it's April uh, before the market opened. We also provided this uh, information to the editors of the informs journals to see whether we will be performing well with our analytical methods here. And turns out that it was extremely successful. We put out a summary report and, and I want to highlight the fact that the 2017 vintage uh, was a very challenging year from a climatic perspective. And even with that, we had very good results. We test our models using the out of sample uh, testing quite a bit. And I want to highlight that uh, that is the case uh, in our analytical work. So what do we do? We train our model, model nine, with past data and use that in order to make estimations for the future. Specifically, we use, for example, data up until 2014, run model nine, get the coefficients, and then make predictions for 2015. Then we add 2015 prices, train it again, recalibrate, and make estimations for the 2016 vintage. We keep doing that until now, and, and as you see, the last uh, vintage that we actually did it from this perspective was 2017, although we continue with that. Uh, the results are quite uh, dramatic, 9% error. And if you recall from earlier conversations, 36% uh, or so um, errors, this is substantially better performance than uh, best benchmark that we have uh, in the field. Um, in fact, the vice president um, of Lyrex informed us that your predictive model is certainly the most accurate I have seen of all of the work we have either done ourselves or participated with uh, other um, scholars. So now it's basically establishing the realistic prices, benchmark prices for the whole uh, one industry for that. So we can definitely say that as they call our prices, realistic prices, they completely crash it pun intended. So let's do a benchmarking. I mentioned um, Aschenfelter 2008 study, which is the primary foundation uh, that's still sitting on their, um, a lot of the wine businesses uh, there. And we use that model, use our data from you know, uh, training until 2014, making predictions and for 15, 16, 17, and so on. Uh, and we see that their performance is around close to 40% error. That's pretty substantial. And ours is only 11%. So how do we close this gap? And here I'm showing um, various type of modeling approaches. I start with B0, which is corresponding to Ashen Felter 2008 study, in that we only use climatic information, temperatures and rainfall. In model B1, we introduce the LIVEX 100 index. In B2, we add the barrel scores of the tasting exports. But this is using all level panel data. Now, I switch my modeling approach to using change data. 
When I use change data and use all that information, that corresponds to our model seven. And I add the interaction term, which becomes model nine, and compare the results of these five different models to get uh, to how I close the gap between the benchmark study and, and our study. First, we have the weather. When you add the market information, you gain 21% accuracy. You add expert opinion, you add another 3% uh, improvement. You change your variable, as I described, it's 3.65% improvement on your performance. And finally, adding the interaction term, you get another 0.55% accuracy improvement on average. Let's do some robustness check. And in that, I'm gonna use a machine learning algorithm, a, the most popular one, lasso analysis. What does lasso do? It basically selects the most relevant variables from a large set of data. And, and it has the goal of balancing the in-sample fit with the out-of-sample prediction accuracy. But it, but it does it in such a way that um, we use a specific form of lasso analysis called square root lasso with theory-driven rigorous penalization, which controls overfitting. And it guarantees consistent out-of-sample prediction performance. To do that, I already mentioned that we have temperatures, precipitation, market information, tasting expert information, and the interaction term. But I'm gonna add all sorts of variables, negative interaction terms, squared terms. If you believe that the relationship is not linear, that should come into play. Exchange rates, classifications of these wines from the left bank to right bank, there's a different classification. The volume of their production, the value of the wines, number of different wines that they produce, all of that is incorporated into my data. Classification. In the left bank, Napoleon Bonaparte established a classification that's still being used uh, in, um, uh, in Bordeaux. Uh, he described top echelon as the first growth, second growth, and so on. And in the right bank, we have the saint uh, uh classification, which says Grand, uh, Premier Grand Cru Classe A, Classe B. Uh, and, and all of those are listed here. We incorporate that into our analysis. We run the lasso regression. And if you see a positive coefficient, that means that it should be in the pricing formula. And the ones that you see as positive numbers, all of them are components of our model nine. And when you closely examine the square terms or negative interaction terms, you will find that none of them are um, incorporated into or selected by lasso. Square terms, none of them are in the formula. In fact, many people believe that tasting expert scores are not linearly impacting, score, uh, impacting prices, but we find no evidence of that to be the case. So uh, we don't see any kind of convexity, concavity type of relationship. Negative interactions, they are not in the box. Exchange rates, they are not in the formula. Classifications, not selected. Volume, value, unique wines, they are not in the formula. And I wanna highlight the fact that model nine is selected from 8.5 billion or more than that alternative model uh, specifications. So that's pretty rigorous uh, and we're delighted to see uh, that kind of performance from so many alternatives uh, model nine is selected. Then we run a robust regression to see whether our uh, variables are still at the highest significance level. We see that to be the case and uh, we're delighted to, uh, to, to see that kind of performance. Um, then we ask the question um, that um, a lot of these chateaus are in different villages, but they might have very specific chateau specific uh, effects. So what about creating a chateau specific intercept and a corresponding coefficient and run a mixed effects regression, especially if you have some of these uh, variables that we use, if the variance in those is not equal to zero, then you have a chance that uh, there might be some variations across chateaus and, and we should use the mixed, uh, mixed effects regression. 
In this case, the temperatures show a little bit of variation from zero. Um, um, scores and index are uh, very close to zero. They are not zero, but very close to it. But the interaction term definitely deviates from that. So there is some room, perhaps, uh, improvement. So we compared with our ordinarily squares regressions. And as you see, mixed effects does not provide better results. There's no improvement. So our regular method is actually working well. Then we say, you know, how about the fact that we're assuming that we know the prior distribution? What about the hyper prior uh, can be estimated uh, by using a hierarchical base modeling approach? And using that, we replicate the same analysis. We look at the results, no improvement. So our method uh, is still intact. We're also concerned about the fact that we're using log variables and we have an error term. And when you are converting it to absolute price information, the errors may not be the same. And how do you make that variable transformation back to original form? You can do it in two ways, either parametric or non-parametric approach. Non-parametric is normal theory. And the parametric is the smearing estimation method established by Duan's uh, 1983 publication. Uh, we reconduct the analysis. We see some improvement, but it's not consistent. And what this tells us is that our original estimates do not feature any systematic bias. So what's the industry's new reaction? Now we release our estimated prices using different critics prior to the opening of the market. So this is for the 2018 vintage released in 2019. Uh, we provide that and um, even our work is now featured by um, wine advocate and Robert Parker who has been opposing any kind of scientific work uh, for the valuation of those wines because he was the most influential critic in pricing. Uh, but the fact that our work is featured in, in this publication uh, is interpreted as passing the baton. And if you look at the 18 vintage, uh, we do it with wine advocates Lisa Perotti Brown because Parker is now retired. We use James Suckling and also Neil Martin, but um, in this particular year, we only released with um, Perotti Brown and Suckling scores and the estimations based on that. And I want to show something from Vinfolio. Uh, as soon as we released and as soon as the wines are hitting the market as futures contracts, Pavi was an underpriced wine. Our estimation was higher than the release price. It went out of stock. Everybody bought it. Same thing with Grand Poule Lacoste. La Fleur, a very expensive wine, $995. It was immediately out of stock. Another one that we estimated to be uh, its value higher than the release price. Those wines that are priced higher than our estimations started to come down uh, because they weren't selling. So here is on sale by 15%, a 15% higher uh, price wine. So what we see, even though it's very little data point at this point, is that there is an anchoring to the realistic prices, the estimations that we have with this analytical work. I'm going to talk about the very last vintage of futures corresponding to 2019 that are being sold in 2020 during the summer of 2020. Climatic conditions, we estimated the impact of each of these factors into what it does using Neil Martin's, Lisa Perotti Brown's, and James Suckling's scores. Uh, we look at the impact of temperature, precipitation, live uh, index, barrel scores, and, and, and all that. And we came up with our estimations for the very first release in the upstream. So this is when Negociants released the uh, wine futures contract to the secondary market. It's the drumbeat of the entire wine supply chain. This is referred to as the realistic release prices. Um, so. Um, but it's basically corresponding ex negociant price uh, for that. For each chateau, we identified the, whether the release price is less than our uh, estimated prices than it is the case. Uh, you know, we recommend buy or a strong buy for the substantially reduced uh, prices. And we do that for all of the chateaus and come up with a table like this that identifies great value in five wines 
that are priced 30% below their value. And these are in order, Hoyt Brion, Ponte Cane, Mouton Rothschild, Mission Hoyt Brion, and Fijak. These five ones I want you to keep in mind because now I'm gonna show you that what about the uh, consumer prices? So we actually do uh, replicate the same study using consumer prices known as the ex-London prices and conduct the same analysis, identify which ones are uh, below the valuation, the estimation that we have, make strong buy, buy or no recommendation for all of the chateaus and this is the final result. I want you guys to look at the ones that we identified as fantastic value for consumers. Ponte Cane, Mouton Rothschild, Fijac, Hoyt Brion, Mission Hoyt Brion. Same five chateaus. Not in the same order, but the same names. This tells us that the market is transparent in the sense that from the distributors, importers who buy these wines, the savings are passed true to the consumers. So this is a, a wonderful um, uh, observation that we can make from this. So what are the conclusion is, conclusions and insights for us? Um, we're proud to say that our realistic price estimation method is the most accurate and uh, of, the, of the valuation models that we have in the marketplace. Uh, and I invite everyone to continue to improve this. Um, uh, I think it would help the industry quite a bit. Uh, so our predictive analytics helps develop this very rigorous approach. Uh, it uses so much data um, and it's the first of its kind to combine all of these different things and choose which ones should be uh, in the pricing formula. And it's pretty simple because it's relying on four uh, substantial variables. It helps buyers so that they can purchase, uh, they can determine which wines to purchase. They know which ones are underpriced and overpriced. They know the right price before they make these decisions and it helps distributors, importers, restaurateurs, merchants, and consumers as you saw in the very last few slides. It creates a transparent financial exchange with these realistic prices. Um, investors would have the confidence in investing and uh, in this opaque market, this transparency is substantially important. For winemakers, it tells when, I, when they negotiate with the middleman negociant, what kind of uh, profit margin that they can extract from that. So there is, uh, there's still some work to be done in that area, but it tells us um, what kind of negotiation can take place. And more critically for consumers particularly, there are scores, 93. What does 93 mean in terms of dollar value for that? Our work takes these scores and translates them to bottle wine prices. So you get the absolute information um, of that. I learned a lot in the process. This emphasis of change from previous year is equally important at every part of the supply chain. Take the winemaker. The winemaker has the barrels in the cellar. Even if you sell one of these uh, uh, barrels uh, in terms of futures contracts, next year you have to get rid of that wine so that you can bring in the new barrel. So there's this one year planning cycle for the winemaker uh, for, this, um, uh, for this industry. The same is true for the negotiants. Negotiants pay cash to the winemaker. They purchase these futures contracts. They release it to the market. They need to recuperate that cash investment so that they can buy the next vintages uh, futures contracts. So this one year cycle is driving this behavior uh, and that's stemming from the planning side uh, of the operations. Um, I also learned that in the wine industry, higher reaction is present for positive news. Unlike the news media, particularly in these very political days um, uh, where you see more of the negative news being highlighted, uh, in the media we find better coverage when the news is positive uh, for um, wine supply chains. I used to be very uh, skeptical about the tasting experts. In fact, I used to think that we can eliminate them from the pricing formula. It's a subjective evaluation. That was my thought process. 
But it turns out that we cannot do without them. They are influential. When they give one higher point, that translates to approximately 3% price premium, an increase in the price by 3%. And they are influential. Whether they are accurate is a separate question. We don't know it. But at the same time, we can't do without them and their information needs to be incorporated into the pricing formula. After the retirement of Robert Parker, many people are asking who to follow. I don't know the answer. I've been doing this uh, study and I can tell you that that's actually a, a big competition that we have uh, from these relatively um, uh, new um, um, tasting experts. I call it the Game of Thrones of um, uh, quality perception um, establishing wine critics. This kind of approach can be used in other markets, especially we need to develop a very similar approach for California, but it can also be used in, in Wagyu beef, which is also the fine uh, or the premium beef. Uh, the impact of weather is different here. Um, if the temperatures are too high, then uh, the cow does not get enough nutrition and it can lead to a uh, lesser quality, so the relationship of temperatures might be reversed uh, with wine. This can also be used in iron ore and olive oil. And in the case of olive oil, you have very objective metrics for establishing quality. Oleg acidity tests can replace the tasting expert judgment uh, very easily in this industry. This is also similar to technology releases the next generation of iPhone, for example, typically increases in prices. So the caveat here is we might actually uh, see a decrease in the price uh, of the next release. I want to give some um, path for future research direction in this particular um, uh, wine analytics uh, subfield. Climate change. As I'm recording this uh, video, uh, there is an enormous amount of damage that we observed in California because of the wildfires. This is substantial and we need to understand how we can help the risk mitigation techniques uh, for uh, California winemakers and, and winemakers uh, all over the uh, world. Uh, similar issues exist for an increased number of frosts, hail, uh, all of that are important factors for winemakers and we need to help them uh, to mitigate it. We need to develop new indices um, so that we can understand whether a local wine growing region is uh, financially healthy for an investment alternative. So uh, indices are quite beneficial uh, for that perspective to provide um, an aggregate uh, perspective for the uh, sustainable aspect of financial investments. We need to incorporate digital transformation and help uh, these winemakers, distributors, and the entire chain. Here, we can use climatic predictive analytics in order to help whether we should be irrigating uh, vineyards. This technology called variable rate irrigation method relies on IoT and software that's uh, uh, predicting whether it's going to be raining and how much, uh, uh, how much um, uh, irrigation I need to provide to the uh, vineyards, uh, and you can do it actually completely variable between different rows of the vineyard. So the software component of this is going to be still expecting us to develop new uh, methods, um, predictive methods uh, uh, for that. There are many tasting experts, uh, from uh, Antonio uh, Galloni to Jean-Marc Corin to uh, James Suckling and so on. How can we create a consolidated score? I call it the robot score. And if we improve the perception of quality by having a very nicely consolidated, analytically uh, rigorous uh, consolidated score, then we might also improve the pricing and valuation of those uh, wines. Um, as a scholar in this field, I'd like to see more wine analytics experts and in that, uh, I'm inviting every young scholar uh, to examine the challenging problems in this particular industry. There's a lot to do, and I hope that you take this as a motivation and encouragement and, and use it as an inspiring part for your next research project. 
So this is the end of my talk. I'd like to toast with you all for this wonderful um, opportunity to present my uh, work in Wine and Optics. Thank you for your time.